Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Gerard DePippo. I'm a senior fellow in the CSIS economics program. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about sanctions, which are always and forever a hot topic. Joining us, we have Agath Demaray, who has written a book called Backfire, How Sanctions Reshape the World Against U.S. Interests. This is the book. I recommend it. Um, it came out in November, but it's still extremely timely, given given the world we're living in, uh, unfortunately. Um, I should also flag for, for those tuning in live that there is a uh, question and answer function that's in the website. So if you click on the website link to this, you'll see that little box and you can you can ask questions. And hopefully we'll turn to those in the second half. But just to get us started, I guess, so your your background is quite interesting because you transitioned from, well, you've done investment banking, you work for the French government, and now you're working at the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, I'm sure you get this question all the time, but I'm just curious in part because I also left you uh, government in my case the US government but how how does your time uh, in the French government or at the French Treasury color your view of sanctions and and you know how does how does that explain your your interest in this topic that's a perfect scene setting and intro question so thanks so much and thanks so much for having me today well as you said my experience was in investment banking first and then I transitioned to the French Treasury and for six years I worked on economic and financial topics for French Treasury but I was posted abroad I was actually in Moscow in 2014 when the first sanctions were imposed against Russia after Russia annexed Crimea and started to back separatist rebels in the Donbas region of eastern Ukraine and that was really my intro to sanctions pretty much from one day to another, I would say. And already at the time, what I found really interesting is that you had these sanctions, but they had ripple effects all around the world. And we would get some companies telling us, okay, there are sanctions. These are the effects that they have on us. And I found that really, really interesting. And then I moved still for French Treasury to Lebanon. I was posted in Beirut for three years, covering Middle Eastern countries, including many countries under sanctions, such as Iran, but also Syria and Lebanon. Um, and again, I found it really interesting to see the consequences of sanctions um, on the population. I remember I had a friend who was telling me a story, a strange story about how sanctions were making it difficult for him to buy a bike for his son. And I was like, mm, I'm not so sure this is about sanctions. And this is what really gave me the idea that it was really interesting to take a look at sanctions and their ripple effects and side effects globally. And then I moved to London for the Economist Intelligence Unit. I covered, for instance, what I call the Nord Stream 2 saga. I I talk a lot about it in my book. I also covered the US exit from the Iran nuclear deal. I was actually on the ground in 2015 when the deal was signed. So it was quite an interesting thing to see that the US would pull out of the deal. And fast forward now, my book is published and it's really about the global ripple effects of US sanctions. I should make it super clear the book isn't against sanctions, because I know some people have got the message wrong just reading the title, I suspect, of the book. Um, but the book really makes the case that sanctions are super important, but sometimes they backfire. And this is what I try to explore, because they are such an important topic that I would be very keen to make sure that they remain effective. So we will talk about many of those issues. Um, I, I mean, yes, you're right. that I think the, the, the message of your book that I got out of it was basically warning of the unintended consequences or externalities, particularly from unilateral uh, US sanctions. And uh, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, anti-sanctions, but you definitely raise important caveats that I think are, let's say, slightly contrarian to what you might be hearing in DC where I'm based. Um, so to get us started, I mean, start with the, the bottom line up front. So what are just sort of top line what were your key findings in terms of the, the unintended consequences and negative externalities of, of sanctions? Well, I would say that there are three main messages in the book. And the first one is really that US unilateral sanctions are usually not great. So I would say that the key message from the book, and this is what I try to show from a European perspective, as you said, I'm a former French Treasury official. So I was really trying to bring the European perspective to the US debate on sanctions. My publisher is American, and I actually discuss US sanctions mostly in the book. And it was really about a message of the US needing to engage with 
it's a lies. I tell a number of stories in the book. I'm sure that we will delve a bit deeper into them when unilateral sanctions backfired from my perspective, from a European perspective, creating diplomatic tensions with the lies or having an impact on commodities markets. It doesn't mean that the US shouldn't use them, but I think it's important that the US has a clear picture about them and their side effects. Maybe they're the best tool, but we need to have a clear view about their side effects and ripple effects. The second message, and I'm sure that we will talk a lot about this one because I know that you're very keen to discuss it, is about sanctions resistance. Mm. I actually explain in the book, and I don't use this metaphor, I found the metaphor afterwards, that sanctions are a bit like antibiotics. Super important. I don't think that anyone is against antibiotics these days. Antibiotics save lives. But if you use them too much, then you get side effects and you get resistance. And I feel that sanctioned resistance is increasingly happening through the development of new financial tools. I'm sure we will discuss these. Many of these innovations are taking place in China, for instance, alternatives to SWIFT, the global Rolodex of banks. And these will have tremendous consequences on the geopolitical and financial landscape. And finally, the third finding from the book is about export controls, because I think that if we take a look at the lessons learned from several decades of US sanctions, we can learn a lot about how to, well, design export controls that will work as best as possible, and that will also work with US allies. So I would say in a nutshell, these are the top key findings, but of course, I'm, I'm very happy to dig any deeper in any aspect that you find interesting. I, I actually love that antibiotics analogy. And now that you say it, it seems really obvious, but it hadn't occurred to me to use that before. But but that works quite well. Um, and also, I didn't want to pigeonhole you, but yes, I would describe your book as more the European perspective, but mm -hmm. you said that, so it's okay for me to say that, which I think is useful, right? Because here we hear the American perspective. So just to get us get us started, let's talk a little bit about the history. Um, so you, you talk about the US sanctions toolkit being basically three broad buckets. The first would be uh, like trade embargoes, third would be financial sanctions, and the third would be sectoral sanctions. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of the use of those tools over the past few decades? And basically, how does the world of sanctions now look different than, say, 20 or 30 years ago? looks completely different, I would say, and I really like the way you present it. So in the past, actually, sanctions were trade embargoes. I think that this was very clear from 1960 with the first US sanctions against Cuba. Mm -hmm. Trade blockade, trade embargo, very simple, very basic to uh, know how it works. You know, trade is blocked. There are some exceptions, but pretty much every trade is blocked between the US and Cuba. And that was really, I would say, a, a crude and basic tool. And it sometimes most actually very often <laughs> fails to uh, get to its desired outcome. I think that I discuss in the book how there are many flows for trade embargoes and how also they have consequences on the population of the targeted country. So not really a great tool. And so the US toolkit of economic statecraft has really evolved in, I would say, the past two decades, since 9-11, pretty much. I actually discuss in the book what I call the hat moment of OFAC. OFAC is the US Treasury Agency in charge of sanctions. OFAC, after 9-11, was very busy tracking terror groups, of course, Al-Qaeda. But OFAC targeters, targeters or people involved in sanctions, targeting and designing, they actually noticed that a small bank in Macau called Banco Delta Asia was involved in pretty much every single transaction between Pyongyang, North Korea, and the rest of the world. And so they had this idea that to deal a blow to the North Korean regime, maybe the only thing they needed to do was to cut this sole financial conduit between North Korea and the rest of the world. And that's exactly what they did with financial sanctions. And that was the invention of financial sanctions. Nobody really thinks about it these days, but sanctions rely on blocking financial channels. That is to say that it is up to banks to say, well, I'm sorry, I cannot process that transaction between the US and Iran, for instance. It's all about finance. That was the invention of financial sanctions. Then financial sanctions were refined with Iran in the run up to the nuclear deal. I think that the big moment was 2012 when the US and Europe cut off Iran's access to SWIFT and that put Iran in almost complete financial isolation and that led to the conclusion of the Iran nuclear deal. Sanctions had a big impact on the Iranian economy. The Iranian population resented that situation. They elected by Iranian standards a reformist, Hassan Rouhani, tasking him, well, he had pledged to get sanctions lifted. 
by signing a nuclear deal. That's exactly what happened. Then I also discuss in the book Venezuela and finally Russia sanctions since 2014. And I was involved in designing them. And as you said, these were the invention of sectoral sanctions. So some experts would say not really sectoral sanctions had happened in the past, but I would say that Russia was really the big case. What are sectoral sanctions? Well, it's all about targeting entire economic sectors of an economy. For instance, in the case of Russia in 2014, it was the energy, finance, and military sectors. And so I discuss all of these evolutions and how sanctions have become such a crucial tool for economic statecraft, for diplomacy today, precisely because sanctions fill in the void between empty diplomatic declarations on the one hand, you're certainly not going to impress Vladimir Putin, or Xi Jinping, and deadly military interventions on the other hand of the spectrum. And so sanctions fill in this void. They've become very popular. And nowadays, they really rely on financial channels. Well, there's, there's a great answer. There's a lot there. I mean, you're also getting to the question of why the U.S. uses sanctions, but we'll turn to that. So, I mean, basically for uh, the simplified history is that if, if you want to depict the inflection point, it's probably 9-11 and the sort of downstream effects of that. I mean, you talk about actions against North Korea, Venezuela, th those are rogue states, arguably, but they're nation states, whereas, of course, after 9-11, the, the focus was going after Al-Qaeda and terrorist networks and the Taliban, etc. And so I guess it's sort of like the the long shadow of 9-11. It wasn't that the sanctions were initially focused on those targets. It's that over time, you sort of build up the the muscle memory within OFAC and elsewhere to 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 learn to use the sanctions. Therefore, they start to be applied to other things, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. It's it's exactly that. And sanctions nowadays, they can target individual actors, as you've mentioned. They can target, well, actors involved in nuclear proliferation, for instance, or drug cartels or Syrian warlords. But they can also target entire countries. And I would say, as you've said, that this tool has really been refined. I would actually say that it's really been refined over the past two decades. And no, it's it's crucial in the diplomatic toolkit of American policymakers, which is why they are so important. Everybody talks about sanctions these days, uh, but I feel it's it's important to have a view about well their effects and and to make sure that they're used as best as possible. So I'm going to ask you a deliberately broad and unfair question, which I get asked all the time. Do sanctions work? Well, it depends what their objectives are. So to answer your question, I will take the Russia angle, actually, because I've published a lot about the fact that sanctions, from my view, work against Vladimir Putin, and they work very well. So I will use that example. I actually discuss in the book sanctions failures. I think that Cuba is one very clear failure. I also discuss cases when sanctions worked, the Iran nuclear deal. But to answer your question, because I think that Russia is on everyone's mind these days, um, I will use that example. And I'm, I'm really a staunch supporter and backer of sanctions against Russia. I think I'm very high on the list of Russian trolls because of this. <laughs> so let's, <laughs> let's boost my reputation. I think that to take a look at sanctions effectiveness, you need to have a view about their objectives. I think that's very clear. Otherwise, it's a bit like asking whether a screwdriver is working. Well, it depends. <laughs> if you need a screwdriver, certainly. But if you want to do brain surgery, maybe not so much. <laughs> So I think that it is critical to have a clear view about the objectives of sanctions. And that is a problem because m in many cases, we don't really know what the objectives of sanctions are. In the case of Russia, it is not about economic collapse of the Russian regime, because I don't think that's possible or feasible or even desirable. Russia is the ninth largest economy in the world. So if there was an economic collapse in Russia, this would have tremendous consequences for the global economy, tremendous ripple effects. It's also not about regime change. If you ask me about sanctions and if they work, I will tell you if it's about regime change, it pretty much never works. History has shown this is really not the tool to use. Um, and finally, it, is, it isn't about changing Putin's calculus from one day to another in Ukraine. I don't think that would be a realistic goal. I think that sanctions since 2014 have shown that Russia isn't going to change course in Ukraine because the war did start in 2014. Know that we've discussed what the objectives aren't. What are they? Well, I think there are three key objectives of sanctions against Russia. The first one is about sending a message of diplomatic resolve and unity and to display this message to both Ukraine and Russia. And I would say from that perspective, mission accomplished. 
I don't think that Putin expected such tough and robust sanctions against Russia. I don't think he expected that half of the reserves of the Russian central bank would be blocked. And I don't think he expected collaboration between both sides of the Atlantic on sanctions. I think this was, a, well, from my perspective, a positive surprise, but I don't think that was his expectation. The second objective is about making it more difficult for Russia to wage war against Ukraine. And again, sanctions work. Yes, they don't work as well as many people expected in the beginning. Russia has been able to, well, manage things a bit better than expected, but the Russian economy is still in a recession. Well, the fiscal situation of the Russian state isn't too great, especially now that there is a price cap on the exports of Russian oil that are done via Western shipping and insurance companies. So this is all going to restrict the resources of the, the Russian state to wage war against Ukraine, and that's really a long-term endeavor. And finally, third objective, slow asphyxiation of the Russian economy, making it difficult for the Russian energy sector to access Western technology to develop new oil and gas fields, especially in the Arctic. And given how important the Russian energy sector is to the Russian economy, it's one third of Russia's GDP, half of fiscal resources, nearly two thirds of exports. Well, this is going to be a tremendous problem because the resources, the reserves of the Russian energy sector, the oil and gas reserves of current fields, they're fast being depleted, they're coming to maturity. It means that Russia needs to develop new oil and gas fields, but without Western technology, and especially American technology, if we're honest, this is not going to be possible. And actually, the latest data from the International Energy Agency confirmed this. At the moment, 30% of globally traded oil and gas comes from Russia, but this share could fall to 15% by 2030, which is pretty much tomorrow. And this means that Russia will lose its status as a global energy superpower. So that, in a nutshell, that would be my answer to do sanctions work. But again, it depends on their objectives. Yeah, so I, I'd, um, for those who haven't, who haven't read it, there's a report that we put out uh, with the title Bearing the Brunt that was looking at the effectiveness of the sanctions against Russia. Um, I don't claim to be a Russia expert, but I sort of pretended to be one for a few months to, to write that. Uh, my my way of describing kind of the same thing you were saying is that the three d's right sequentially of, of deter destabilize and then and then degrade now deterrence is kind of obvious destabilize but by that i mean that there was actually a brief period in like february march of last year when the russian financial sector looking at flows did look pretty wobbly and people that are sanctions policy experts will claim that that was never truly the objective but if you look at the actual broader policy discourse, that was definitely what was discussed at the time. And now that that's been stabilized, mostly because of, you know, initially capital controls, but then energy revenues, basically. Uh, now we're in sort of degrade mode. It was trying to to um, atrophy the, the Russian defense industrial base, which I mean, I think I have the same assessment of, of you in terms of how they're working with regard to Russia. One, one thing I wanted to, to pull on, though, just because of having looked at this myself, is on the question of, of what Putin believed. Um, I mean, I, I definitely agree that he did not expect a coalition in the same way that happened. And the evidence of that is that um, when the Russians were trying to de-dollarize, they never de-euroized, right? It never occurred to them that that the British and, and the Europeans might be on board at really effectively all the G7. Uh, might, it's like basically all major economies minus China. Um, but on the other hand, it does seem clear from the reporting such as it is, that he was warned that the economic implications would be severe. In fact, probably worse than what he was told by his advisors. From what I could tell, it seemed to be that it was going to be worse at the macro level than it ended up actually being. And my interpretation of that is like, you know, obviously he, he decided to go anyway. It was that um, <laughs> he, he thought the war was going to be quick, right? So, so you don't want to fix all variables. So if you believe or if he believed that you could have taken Kiev in like five days or whatever and get, get some you know, settlement with the Ukrainians, in that world, I suspect that, that the EU would not be like on its 12th package or whatever. It would be stopped at like the third and, and we would not have anything like the level of unity we had. So in a sort of twisted way, I think Putin's logic is internally coherent. Um, and which my my big takeaway from that, which where I'm getting is that I'm actually quite skeptical that any degree of sanctions threats, including with the European allies, would have made all that much of a difference. Um, we'll never know. But that's just my my best guess. W what's your thought on that? 
Well, lots to unpack. I was frantically trying to take notes about yeah, all the things that I that I wanted to to say um, in response to your question. The first thing is that, and I think that's the conclusion of my book because I actually finished the first draft in mid 2021, and then of course February 2022 happened, so I updated it and I updated the conclusion of the book. I don't think that any threats were enough to deter the invasion. Um, so I think I, I completely agree with you on this one. I don't think that threats were enough. I think that is absolutely clear. And I don't think that any threats would be enough to change anything now, because I think that Putin assumes that, well, he's burned bridges pretty much with Western countries. I think that he does believe, I mean, no one knows what he really believes, and I think we should be very careful here, but I'm pretty sure that he believes he sees the war as existential. He, he really thinks that he's in a war with Western states. So he has nothing to lose and he's burned bridges, I think. So I think that's that's the first thing. And actually, when we take a look at the long term picture, I think it's a long term picture of decoupling. You know, we talk a lot, about, a lot about US China decoupling, but China has a vassal. It is Russia. And so Russia will align with China and it will be part of this decoupling trend. And we're seeing this actually when we take a look at Russia's energy exports, oil in particular, they're being rerouted away from Europe towards, well, China a little bit, but especially India. Actually, Russia has become the first supplier, the biggest supplier of oil to India. So I think that is really significant. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing is that I completely agree with you. I think that Putin expected a quick invasion. So I think there was highly probably a very big intelligence blunder here from the Russian part. I think it's been documented actually in a few reports that Russians were expecting a warm welcome so that was a massive, massive, um, well, failure, intelligence failure. But if you expect a quick invasion, you then expect things to be over in a matter of days. And if you don't expect resistance, well, you know, I think that it made perfect sense that Putin didn't expect such big sanctions. Then to go to your point about the collapse of the financial sector, I think it was the intended policy in the first weeks, if we're completely honest. I think that blocking half of the reserves of the Russian central bank, that was the, the goal, was to provoke a financial crash in Russia. But as you said, there was a good response from the Russian central bank, capital controls, they really helped, very tough, robust response. And also the spike in energy prices really helped the Russian state. So I think that it was a policy in the beginning. And then when this policy failed from Western states to provoke a financial crash, well, Western states went to the degrade mode, as you say, and it is going to be a long-term thing, also because the war isn't an invasion of just a few days. It's been more than a year now, and unfortunately, I would expect the war to last much longer. Finally, a few more things on Europe. I agree with you. I don't think that Putin expected actually collaboration between both sides of the Atlantic. I think that he bet that the same divisions than the divisions that happened in 2014, when the US actually wanted much more robust measures on the Russian energy sector, I think that he expected them to play out, well, in the same way. I don't think that Putin ever expected Europe to turn away and to get away from, it, from its dependency on Russian oil and gas. And actually here, I would argue that he shot himself in the foot by turning off the gas tax, because this showed Europeans that he wouldn't shy away from taking bold measures to weigh on European economies. And so that Europeans, you know, had better completely stop relying on Russian energy. That's the, the final point. And finally, on collaboration, well, I, I would just say that again, I found it really positive, a really positive surprise. I don't say surprise still, but still, it was a, a question mark, would there be big collaboration between the US and the EU on sanctions? And so far, it's been really robust. And again, I don't think that Putin ever expected that. I mean, I, for what it's worth, I'm certainly far less knowledgeable about Europe than you are, but I am at least pleasantly surprised by that degree of collaboration. And also, uh, frankly, surprised to a degree by um, EU like resiliency and solidarity given what's happened. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see it basically that, you know, like you, I, I support the sanctions on, on Russia and think that Putin certainly deserves it. Um, but it's um, maybe to some ears might be a little bit odd to consider the Russia case as a sanction success. I mean, I, I take your point and I agree with you, but mm -hmm. there might be clearer examples of success. And we'll turn back to Russia and you mentioned China and obviously we'll talk about that. Um, but a few other examples. So you mentioned in your book, Libya, as being an example that of successful sanctions. Now, this story has probably been sort of memory hold given what happened in Libya after 
But can you just quickly summarize that? And then I want to talk about more broadly the conditions that make successful sanctions work. Yeah, I think actually that the Libya case is a very interesting one because it illustrates the point of my book about U.S. unilateral sanctions. The U.S. went it alone for sanctions against Libya, the Libya of Muammar Gaddafi in the 1980s and 1990s. And first, these sanctions really failed. You know, Libya was absolutely the, well, it epitomized a rogue state. But, you know, the U.S. had failed to convince its allies, its Western allies, mostly Europe, that Libya posed a grave threat to global stability. So the US first imposed sanctions alone and Muammar Gaddafi did, well, something that I found very logical. He said, okay, no problem. You know, we can just reorient our exports and source ex well technology for our energy sector from other places. We won't use anything American. That's, that's fine. You know, we can survive. That's also what Cuba has done since 1960. And then Actually, um, what happened was that the Libyan state, well, Muammar Gaddafi, well, they bombed airplanes uh, over Lockerbie, for instance, and over Niger, an African country. And this got Europe on board with sanctions against Muammar Gaddafi. And so we had a clear case of a sanctions coalition putting the Libyan economy under tremendous pressure. And Muammar Gaddafi, after a few years, gave in. And he actually well, said, okay, I can't go on. So he accepted Western demands and in return, he got sanctions lifted. But I think that this is really an interesting case of US unilateral sanctions failing, but a broad coalition of sanctions working. And I think that this is a really good example to keep in mind. I discuss it in more detail um, in the book, but I think that's, uh, that's actually a very good example. That's often forgotten. But also just I mean, to pull in the thread there, uh, so when Gaddafi basically agreed to the demands, that was mm -hmm. what year, like 2005-ish? I'm trying to remember. Um, I think it was uh, 1990s, if oh, I'm okay. not mistaken. Uh, I think it was 1990s. It was, for instance, to um, hand in the suspects of the oh, airplane bombings okay. to authorities. And in return, the sanctions were lifted. There were also some UN provisions here. Um, but that, of course, uh, a lot of things happened in Libya afterwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and no, so I, that's... I, I was thinking of, of the denuclearization mm -hmm. part, right? Because at one point, I think Libya was trying to develop nuclear weapons. Yeah. And eventually, they abandoned it. But I was going to suggest that maybe that was because of uh, fear of US military action, which which had been demonstrated elsewhere. Um, but but all right, we won't do on Libya, but I just thought that was an interesting case. It probably has been largely forgotten. But looking, you know, one, one of the great things you do in your book is looking at those examples, trying to extract some uh, like heuristics of, of you have identified four factors that will, mm -hmm. you know, or sort of variables that, that determine whether sanctions do or do not work. Um, arguably there's five, depending how you break it, break it down. But do you want to talk about those, those, those four things? Yes, absolutely. And I actually discuss in the book a sanctions case that I found really interesting and often forgotten. It was sanctions against Turkey in 2018. And I think they were a very good example of sanctions working and they did work. What happened in 2018 is that the Turkish state detained an American pastor, Andrew Brunson, and that led to the imposition of sanctions against Turkey. So the first thing that is very clear is that these sanctions had a very, very clear objective. You know, we've discussed the fact that it is crucial to know the objective of sanctions for sanctions to work. Also, because otherwise the targeted country doesn't know what it needs to do to get sanctions lifted. So clear objective in the case of Turkey, well, getting Pastor Andrew Brenton being released. So clear objective is one. The second factor is that you need to impose sanctions on an economic partner. If you have zero economic ties, this isn't going to work. The way I put it in the book is that partners have much to lose, but adversaries do not. And actually, this is something to keep in mind for the cases when sanctions are imposed for a very long time. Because when a country can reroute trade entirely, well, gradually, sanctions may become ineffective. That's not the case for Russia, because sanctions against Russia are a completely different beast. But I think in the cases of small economies, sometimes they're able to reorient trade, but you still need to target economic partners. Another thing, and that is also very interesting, it applies mostly to small economies, is that sanctions tend to work fast or never. And actually, in the case of Turkey, it only took a few months 
for sanctions to get to their desired outcome. Again, big caveats in the Russian case, we're in for the long haul. And this is because the Russian economy is so big. So I wouldn't say there is a one size fits all for sanctions criteria and objectives and the criteria for sanctions to work. But this is still something to keep in mind. Another one to keep in mind is that multilateral sanctions actually work for better um, than unilateral sanctions. I think that we've just discussed the Libya case. It is a very clear one. There is a catch here, however. The first catch is that if you want to impose sanctions via the United Nations, mm, it's very difficult these days because you have Russia and China, which are permanent members of the UN Security Council. So obviously this limits things that are feasible quite a bit. And the second thing is that multilateral sanctions, well, they tend to take much more time to be drafted because, you know, you need to have a consensus. So these are arguably more difficult. These are the four criteria, but there's actually a fifth one that I like to mention. It is the fact that sanctions tend to work best when the population of targeted countries has a say in governance. You know, I mentioned Iran a few minutes ago at the start of our event. What happened in Iran up to the conclusion of the nuclear deal in 2015 was that the population was resenting the impact of sanctions. The Iranian currency had collapsed. The economy was in a recession. The situation was really pretty dire. And so that's why they elected a president who had pledged to get sanctions lifted. But if you don't have that link for the population to at least voice its displeasure, well, that is obviously a problem. And this is worrying because in most cases, sanctions do not target countries that are democratic. You know, between democracies, we tend to resolve problems between ourselves without needing to, to resort to sanctions. So these are the five criteria, but again, I wouldn't say it's a one size fits all. And actually no sanctions regime has ever met all of these criteria. We have clear cases of sanctions wins, Libya, Iran, for instance, that didn't meet all of these criteria, but still it's useful to keep this in mind. Yeah, it was the, the fifth one which you identified that I, I, I found fascinating of the, the type of government basically arguing that, I mean, if not necessarily literal democracy, you need some type of feedback mm -hmm. mechanism. But of course, as you say, the vast majority of targets as states go are going to be non-democratic or probably illiberal, at least. And so there's kind of a, a, a I, when we're talking about international relations or even sanctions or anything like that in, in particular, I always wish that the sample were much bigger that the world had you know more more relevant modern history because we don't actually have that many examples but it does seem right that that um there just isn't good evidence that uh dictatorial or authoritarian regimes uh buckle one given uh, under the threat of sanctions on the other hand like the sample of democratic countries facing those kinds of sanctions is pretty small i'm actually struggling to think of an example i mean South Africa was apartheid, but sort of had like a narrow type of democracy, right? But that eventually kind of worked. Um, and so I'm just wondering, like, is there any example of, of like, the, the like, is there example of the political process, whether authoritarian or democratic, causing the change in behavior that the sending country is trying to impose? Well, I would mention Iran because yeah. there is this very. And again, it is by Iranian standards that we're saying that Hassan Rouhani was a reformist. Iran is a theocracy. It has a dismal human rights record. But the Iranian population still has a limited say in governance with elections um, to elect their president. So we have that one. Then I think actually I was I was trying to think whether we can categorize Turkey. Uh, well, Turkey holds elections and it is actually going to hold big elections over a weekend, but it doesn't really work because the sanctions that were imposed against Turkey in 2018 were very limited. They were against individuals. So you wouldn't have that impact on the Turkish economy. So it wouldn't really qualify. South Africa, well, I'm not sure. This is really a big debate. I won't enter that debate. Was it sanctions that provoke the change in behavior or not? Really heated debate. Actually, South Africa is the only example I think that I don't mention in the book because I tried to research it and I really had the impression that I was opening a big can of worms and that would be the topic for an entire completely different book. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, discuss this one too much. But so, yeah, as, as you say, it is very, very difficult to actually find a clear case um, of such a thing happening. And that is obviously an issue. And actually, if we, if we go even further, 
we have clear cases, Russia is one, of authoritarian countries, but Venezuela does that too, Cuba does that too. Well, these authoritarian regimes, they tend to use sanctions as scapegoats for their own economic shortcomings and failures. And that is very easy to do, you know, because in these authoritarian states, you have state propaganda. So if you do something wrong, just blame sanctions. Sanctions have become the scapegoat. And Russia does things actually with a twist and pushes things even further because Russia is peddling disinformation about the supposed global impact of sanctions against Russia. And it is spreading false narratives, disinformation, propaganda, fake news in many emerging countries, especially in Africa, trying to establish a link between sanctions against Russia and food insecurity. Sanctions do not target Russia's food exports. It is actually Russia's blockade of Ukrainian ports that is the problem. Um, and energy insecurity. Well, it is Russia's decision to invade Ukraine that has provoked a spike in energy prices. But this propaganda really works. And that is also a problem for us in democracies, in Western democracies, because we don't have the tools to respond to this disinformation. We don't do information campaigns about the goals and how sanctions work. So we're really not on the same footing to tackle this issue. So let, let's stay on Russia since you mentioned it again, but let's go back a little bit in time. So before before the February 2022 invasion, um, but after 2014. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure Europeans are well aware. I'm not sure how well Americans are aware of the drama behind the Nord Stream 2 sanctions. Can you can you talk about that, describe what it is and give the you know the European perspective on, on how that went down? I have a full chapter on this yeah, one. I know. It's <laughs> chapter seven in the book. And I what I try to do in the book is give the European perspective about the Nord Stream 2 pipeline saga. So Nord Stream 2 was supposed to be a pipeline connecting Russia to Germany, doubling the capacity of the existing, well, no different, Nord Stream pipeline that was already connecting Russia to Germany to um, ship Russian gas to Europe. And so what happened is that the US was opposed to the project. But there was a precedent, actually, uh, in the 1980s, the former Soviet Union had already had issues to build a pipeline connecting um, actually a gas field in Siberia to Europe. The US was opposed to the project. The US imposed a lot of sanctions, even retroactive sanctions against the project. But these sanctions failed. The pipeline was built. And it, from my perspective, showed that sanctions against allies, unilateral sanctions against the wishes of allies, were a complete waste of time. And Nord Stream 2 was absolutely a repeat of that. What happened is that the US tried everything to block the construction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. What I try to do in the book is not to enter the debate of whether it was a good idea or a bad idea to build a pipeline. I, well, I didn't want to enter that debate. What I wanted to try to show is that of course, the debate was raging in Europe about whether it was a good idea or a bad idea, but there was a consensus in Europe about the fact that the US was taking things one step too far by imposing crushing sanctions to derail a project that was essentially between Russia and Europe. That was really the view in Europe at the time, and it really fueled diplomatic tensions. And I actually say in the book that it may have been a better idea for allies not to argue about that pipeline because it just distracted them from talking about the real topics. And I'm pretty sure that Putin was rejoicing every time he saw cracks in the transatlantic partnership. So I think that this was a waste of time, if you really ask me, because in the end, the pipeline was built. And it is only when Germany decided to pull the plug that the project was abandoned. So it needed to be a European decision. And I actually well, would bet, I don't know that, but I mention it in the book and I would bet that the willingness of Angela Merkel, the former Gen German chancellor, to continue with the project despite the opposition of many people, despite everything that had happened in Russia, I actually discussed the poisoning of Navalny, despite the pressure, she still wanted to go on and try to build a pipeline. And I think that this was to show some resolve to Americans and trying to send a message that if Europe wanted to build that pipeline, it wouldn't give in to US demands. Um, and I think that we had some pretty interesting declarations after some US Congress uh, men said they would put German port stevedores under sanctions if they built the pipeline. Uh, I think that this really provoked some furor and outrage in Europe. And this really, from my perspective, fueled Europe's willingness to do what it wanted to do, to show the US that it wouldn't give in to US demands. Mm 
So, I mean, from from the American perspective, playing devil's advocate or America's advocate here, um, I think that maybe quasi half rebuttal would be, but the U.S. concerns ended up being vindicated, mm -hmm. right? So Putin act, ended up using gas as a weapon uh, and ended up having military ambitions that were far beyond what the European governments expected. And so how would you respond to that? Would you still say, yeah, but it's that still doesn't make it worthwhile? So I completely agree that the U.S. Uh, concerns were completely valid and they were valid from the very beginning. But if you think about it, the process of sanctions, well, at the time, it was hard to know that U.S. concerns were valid. And what happened is that these sanctions, these U.S. unilateral sanctions and secondary sanctions against European firms, they only fueled a transatlantic dispute that distracted the US and the EU from the real topic, which was how to tackle Russia's aggression. Because while European capitals in Washington were arguing about these sanctions, well, you know, Putin was continuing everything that he wanted to do. So I think that it was a distraction and I think that it distracted allies from the real big issue. And I actually don't believe that cracks in the transatlantic partnership are ever a good thing. I'm actually all for a very solid and strong transatlantic partnership. So I think that from that perspective, I'm not sure that sanctions were, were a good thing. And as I said, they failed. You know, in the end, it was only when Angela Merkel decided to abandon the project that the project, well, got cancelled. Well, so there might be some uh, very important and actually already being implemented lessons from what you're saying, right? So at the time, the question was, what are Russia's intentions? And now the debate is, what are China's intentions? Mm -hmm. And you have a whole chapter in your book, uh, called when sanctions work too well why decoupling from china would backfire um there's a lot in that area and probably a lot has changed even since you wrote that but i think you know maybe one argument is it seems to me that the biden administration is trying to be fairly careful in how it's handling europe especially with russia but even even with china where there is a debate in this town where we're frankly much more focused on china um, and taiwan specifically um, than my sense is in Europe, although that seems to be changing to a degree in recent months, given certain statements. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what's your take on, on sort of the lessons learned there and, and what is the actual like path forward for, from the U.S. perspective, how do you convince uh, an important partner, in this case, the EU, that you have a worry that they're not quite on board with, but you also don't want to like twist their arm too much and threaten to break it, right? So I can give the European perspective about that one. I yeah, cannot give the American perspective about how to twist Europe's arm. Yeah. <laughs> but I think actually it's perfect that you asked me that question about Nord Stream 2 just before, because one of the first decisions of the Biden administration was to cancel the sanctions on Nord Stream 2. That was shortly after the inauguration. And I think that it was hailed as a very positive sign from the European perspective of Biden wanting to work with allies and maybe avoiding some of the mistakes from the European perspective that had been made in the past. So I think that this was a very positive development. And of course, as you say, no, all eyes are on US-China relations and export controls. Actually, the last third of the book is about how I believe that export controls will be the sanctions of tomorrow because everything is about tech these days and the US-China conflict is going to define the global geopolitical landscape and economic landscape, financial landscape, technological landscape, everything pretty much is going to, to define everything. So the big question here now for the US is what to do with the European Union, because the European Union isn't really on board with US export controls against China. I think that the European Union is fearing a repeat of US secondary sanctions. We haven't really discussed these, but just to define the concept, when the US imposes secondary sanctions, as it does against Iran, for instance, at the moment, it essentially tells all companies around, all around the world, American and foreign, that they need to make a choice between the targeted market, in that case Iran, and the American market, in that case the US. Well, so, you know, it's not really a choice. <laughs> and that's what happened after the US exited the nuclear deal in 2018. The US imposed secondary sanctions on Iran. European companies, I actually discuss um, that case in the book, had to withdraw from the Iranian market. So that had tremendous consequences. And I I think there was a lot of resentment um, in Europe. And I think the view in Europe these days is that, well, there is a fear that this is a repeat of US secondary sanctions with Europe having to choose sides between the US and China. That is 
a very complicated question. I'm not entirely sure the EU has a clear strategy in that field. I think the US strategy is extremely clear. I think the Chinese strategy is extremely clear. I think the EU still needs to define its strategy. At the moment, the buzzword is de-risking in Brussels. It's not decoupling, it's de-risking. I'm not entirely sure what that means and what the difference is. But I think this all points to the fact that the EU needs to have its strategy. But I think the US would benefit from having a stronger EU and a more autonomous EU because you really want to have stronger allies. So the key question is how to work with Europeans, how to work with companies such as ASML in the Netherlands, which does equipment to manufacture top-notch semiconductors. That's all very tricky. I don't think that there are good answers, but certainly no US unilateral restrictions, um, because I think that there is a fear in Europe that this would be a repeat of, of US um, secondary sanctions, and that would fuel resentment probably at a time when we really need collaboration on Russia, on China, on other countries. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll defend the, the phrase de-risking, which is now the preferred nomenclature, both from in Europe and as of Jake Sullivan's speech the other week in the United States. I mean, I, mean, I think the difference is they're trying to say that it's about mitigating specific risks and not about severing economic ties per se. I mean, mm -hmm. it's both they're imperfect, but I think they're the risking is probably preferable. You know, my, my sense from talking to EU officials is, um, I mean, the EU has it's a con it's a consensus based organization, right? That's supranational. Uh, it has export control regimes are supposed to be at the member state level, right? They're not, they're not yet at a, as a overall EU level. And I think part of, you know, my, my read on the EU, and I'm curious, um, I mean, I don't want to take us too far astray, but I'm curious about this, is that the EU was designed primarily to be a market in, in integration instrument, right? So basically it's about liberalizing and reducing barriers. It wasn't designed to be sort of a coalition to fight external issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think they're kind of struggling to adapt to the fairly quick change of attitude in Washington, where it went from being, you know, for lack of a better word, neoliberal to whatever we want to call what we are now for the past five years, whereas it seems the EU is is not, they're kind of caught institutionally in a previous period under which it was designed, right? And I think now because of China and the concept of economic security in, in more generally, that's where it's really coming to, to a head. I mean, I, I actually would contest that the U.S. has a very clear strategy. I think we're, we have more obvious aggressive tools, um, but but the strategy of where, what the end state is, is is less obvious to me. Um, but, you know, what what's your view? I mean, I I, I guess the, the, maybe the, the more operative question is how do we, given where we are in the real world today <laughs> um, and the lessons we've learned and what's happened since your book was, was written and published, um, how do we think about the risks of de-risking, let's call it, with China, and you have a whole chapter on this, but also, you know, what are the lessons from Russia that would apply to China? So in particular, you you seem to suggest that, that you know, economic integration in the case of China is a potential deterrent and maybe could preempt uh, catastrophe, the worst being war, obviously, uh, but clearly that was not sufficient for Russia. So what's, mm -hmm. what's different in the case of China that, that should make us think that that strategy would, would succeed? I don't think that China can afford to lose both the US and the EU at the same time, which I think is the reason why the US really needs the EU. I think that the view from China today is that, well, there is no chance of an improvement between the US and China in bilateral relationships. We hear a lot about diplomacy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I fail to see any area for big cooperation or for an improvement of relations. There are some limited areas for partnership between the US and China, but the big picture is really bleak. I still don't believe, though, that China can afford to lose the EU at the same time. China needs to, well, have access to the European market. It, it just cannot lose both partners at the same time. So that would be the first thing. Um, then to, to go back to your broader question, I think that the debate in Europe, well, there are many, many considerations in debate in Europe these days. I think that it has become clear in Europe these days that if the European Union isn't a coherent, cohesive bloc, it won't really have a say on the international landscape. I think that to, well, of course, I'm French and I would love France to have a say in world governance. But if I'm honest, I don't think that France in itself 
really has a voice and really has a uh, big, big weight uh, in global governance. I think that it's about the EU. It has to be at the EU level when you are competing with the US and China. However, this is very difficult to do because, as you said, the EU likes, you know, unanimity. This is changing, actually. There are some proposals to take foreign policy decisions um, with a majority of votes between EU member states. This is slowly changing, but this is a problem. And I'm not entirely sure that everyone also has realized that the EU needs well, that essentially the, the appropriate level <laughs> is the European level, not the member state level. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Brexit, but I'll still mention this word. Um, then the key question is, shall we rely on the US or not? I think that if you ask a number of Eastern European countries at the moment, such as Poland, for instance, are very happy to rely on the US umbrella, very happy to do that. You know, they I'm not entirely sure that they would be super keen to completely deepen European integration. I think that they're very happy to have deeper ties with the US and that would maybe be a priority for them. So there is this key question and this divide between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Then there's the question of EU autonomy. It has been the buzzword um, actually since I would say the invasion of Ukraine. It was all about European autonomy, how to respond to US secondary sanctions. Is a digital euro a possibility? We even had Instex, uh, an instrument to essentially circumvent Iran sanctions, which for me was a big red flag, or should have been a big red flag from the US coming from allies. It's all about the, the debate about autonomy, but what does that really mean? I fail to see, again, a strategy about how to put that into practice. Coming to the lessons uh, about what to do with China, and I'm conscious of time uh, also, because this conversation is absolutely fascinating and I'm sure we could talk for hours, but yeah. the, the lessons, I would say three key lessons, and actually it's drawing on the lessons from sanctions. The first one is engage allies. Maybe you will have more robust export controls if you go down the unilateral route from the US perspective. But I think that the Libya case, you know, that we discussed shows that multilateral and co well coalitions, they just work better for such measures. And as I said, I don't think that China can afford to lose the US and the EU at the same time. The second lesson uh, is I don't think we should expect China to sit tight. I don't think that we should expect China to say, oh, oops, sorry, we've lost access to uh, advanced semiconductors. Well, that's a shame. We will do something else instead. As I discussed in the book, I think that we should expect China to double down on indigenization of technology. And I think that China is making great strides in that field. And actually, it is playing, you know, time. It has objectives up to 2049, the centenary of the creation of the state um, of China. When we in Western democracies, you know, sometimes our horizon is a four year presidential term, for instance. So I think that China has has a clear asset here. Um, so I, I would say this would be my two key, um, well, lessons learned from sanctions. But of course, this is all very, very difficult um, in practice. But I would hope for a greater transatlantic collaboration on these topics. So let's let's uh, recognize we're running out of time. Let's let's continue the conversation about China. And also more broadly, um, existing real world mitigation strategies. So I guess you know, the Russia case is the best example we're going to have now of how certain countries, including China, are trying to get around those sanctions and export controls. What are you observing in terms of, um, let's say, Russia and or China's ability to, you know, get leakage through the, through the controls or find mm -hmm. workarounds? Mm -hmm. What are this? What are there still sort of enduring vulnerabilities that are that you know the sanctions and export controls still seem to be having an effect that's a big question the yeah. first thing that i would say is that there is a lot of discussions around sanctions or convention i am not convinced that russia is managing to circumvent sanctions at the necessary scale for its economy you know when you discuss sanctions or convention for belarus very small economy okay the Belarusian state may manage to circumvent sanctions and to get what it needs. When you're talking about Russia, the ninth largest economy in the world, this is far harder if you're talking about imports, because I, I think actually that we shouldn't forget that, well, in 2022, certainly until December, sanctions mostly targeted Russian imports. 
the ability of the Russian state to source technology from Western countries. And so the key question here is, did China come to Russia's rescue? And I actually argued in a foreign affairs piece that was published two weeks ago, not really. When you take a look at the data, well, Chinese exports to Russia only grew by around 30% last year. That sounds solid, but it's actually in line with the rise in Chinese exports to other trade partners for China. So, of course, this doesn't capture sanctions evasion, but I would be very skeptical that such evasion is for very large volumes. You know, we can see very big growth rates, um, for instance, in trade uh, for semiconductors between Turkey and Russia. Yes, of course. But when you take a look um, at the values, actually, they're far more modest. So, that actually is the first thing on sanctions um, circumvention. Then to take a look at exports, there were a number of papers, very interesting papers, showing that Russia still manages to export some of its oil above the oil price cap, um, mostly from the Cosmino terminal in eastern Russia. This is happening. This is certainly happening. And what this all points to is to the fact that from my perspective, no is not the time maybe to devise more sanctions, but more to work on implementation. I think that tightening the screws of sanctions implementation will be the big challenge ahead. I think there are a number of things to do here. There is something to do in Europe because European sanctions are adopted at the European level, but they're implemented at the member state level, which is obviously a problem because some member states can have more lenient interpretations of sanctions law than others. This creates loopholes. So that will be a first challenge. And the second challenge, of course, is to get other countries, I don't want to say on board the sanctions effort, but to at least stop being smuggling hubs. I'm thinking of Turkey here, the United Arab Emirates, um, Serbia also, Hong Kong, other places like that, that have seen a rise um, in their exports to Russia. So implementation will be a bit challenge. And I would actually mention still the second challenge. I've mentioned it already. It's about tackling Russian disinformation, but this takes us too far. And I recognize we don't we don't have time to discuss everything, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I, I realize like I have 30 minutes at least more, but <laughs> we have two minutes left. I mean, on that, I, I agree actually with that the current thrust of sanctions in the EU and the US is to basically tighten the screws, as you say, sort of plug the holes, whatever analogy you want. On the on the China issue, I, I do think, um, well, one, you and I are both on Twitter, so I read your article and retweeted it, but added a, a chart on top of it showing that China's exports to Central Asian countries are clearly spiking well above trend. Mm -hmm. And then those same countries are exporting more into China. So I do think there's some suspicious trend shipment going on. Uh, it's not, it, it's probably not enough to make up aggregate volumes, as you say, but you already fly like Turkey, UAE are the really big ones that are getting attention, but also like Kyrgyzstan and some of the other Central Asian republics are, um, I think, at least sort of at the top line, the numbers are, are suspicious. Um, so we're just about out of time. I was going to ask about digital currencies, but I kind of doubt that we can do that in 90 seconds, unless you have some very quick, like very short top lines of what you think the rule of digital currencies are insofar as sanctions are concerned. I can do that. Um, 90 no. seconds. Okay. No, no. Sanctions, vaccination is going to be the big topic of tomorrow for targeted countries. This takes place with three tools. The first one is de-dollarization or de-euroization. Since 2021, Russia and China have dominated their bilateral trade, mostly in rubles or in yuan. And that's certainly in a bid to shield sanctions, to shield themselves from sanctions. Second tool, alternatives to SWIFT. Um, China leads the way here. It's called SIPS, connects 1,300 banks all around the world already, American banks, European banks, Russian banks, of course, Chinese banks. And so China has a plan B, a backup plan in case it is cut off from the SWIFT network. And finally, central bank digital currencies, as you mentioned, that's the third tool, probably the most promising tool, because these are completely immune to Western sanctions. These are stored on the digital wallets, on the mobile phones of people, completely managed digitally by central banks. They're not reserve currencies. It has nothing to do with reserve currencies, but they're used to settle trade domestically, potentially maybe one day internationally, although this is not happening yet. And these are completely sanctions proof. And so the big picture is that in a few decades, it goes back to sanctions resistance, antibiotics. Sanctions could become ineffective against rogue states. And I think that this would be a tremendous shift for American and Western diplomats in general. I think I made it 90 seconds. Yes, great, great, succinct answer. 
uh, shameless plug on, on May 16th, we're having a separate session that will look at China's counter sanction strategy. And we'll talk about some of the things you just mentioned, which I would like to peel on, but we don't have time. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. That was a that was a fantastic discussion. Um, a lot more to, to say. Perhaps we could have an, a follow up at some point. Um, but but, you know, this issue is certainly not going away. Uh, the the book is Backfire, How Sanctions Reshape the World Against U.S. Interests. Uh, I think it should be on everyone's sanctions bookshelf at this point, given where the world is. So, Agath Damare, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for, who tuned in. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.